Good morning. We'll be looking at Revelation chapter 5 and Jeremiah chapter 32 will be our main passages. And uh, I asked the Lord to give me something special and he did. <laughs> it, it's Before we get started, let's pray. Our dear, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this precious time that we can come and open up your word and see how wonderful you are and how wonderful your word is and how small we are compared to you. Lord, I pray that you'll fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me to teach this lesson correctly. And Lord, let no words proceed out of my mouth that are contrary to your word. For I ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. You know, I, I always like to put what's in the news before we get started because it kind of sets the precedence and it just makes you pray for the Lord to come back that much more. The person in the White House has declared Christians terrorists Iran has a nuclear weapon. Israel's is about ready to uh, have to do something. Businesses are willing to go bust to, to support this transgender movement. And I was reading this week and listening, and I learned about the rainbow goddess, Iris, who sometimes appears as a horse with wings, and I got this off the Internet, you know, it's a, a, a good um, Christian site, so it didn't steer me wrong. She's the mother of Apollo and Artemis, which is Diana. We just had a rocket go up named Artemis. She is also known as the light bearer, so she's connected to Lucifer. She appears as a horse with wings and a rainbow. And this is what a lot of kids or, or mothers are buying their children to play with. The elite Satanists, and I put this, I sent out a video on this, plan to kill you and your children. And a lot of stuff is coming out about what's happened in the past is, was planned. They discovered years and years ago, and I sent this email out also, the Nazis discovered that if you can sexually pervert someone, they cannot take in the truth or information. They can't process it. Makes sense. God calls it a reprobate mind. Call on the Lord today while there's still time because Time is running out, and we're about ready to go home. In Psalms chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Why do the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, and that's exactly what's going on right now. I've said this time and time again, but the governments know that Jesus Christ is about to return and they're planning for it. He that setteth in the heaven shall laugh and the Lord shall make them in derision. That word derision is a laughing stock. And this country is a prime example of a laughing stock. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 20 says, For if after they had escaped the pollution of this world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. And we are seeing that starting. You need to pray that the Lord comes back and takes us out of here and judges this world because you wouldn't believe what children are going through right now. Chapter 4 said, we, we read about chapter 4 in Revelations, and it talked about the Lord Jesus Christ being worshipped as a great creator. 
Chapter 5, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be worshipped as a kinsman redeemer. Now go to Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 6. This is a prophecy that God told Jeremiah to do, but everything is, all these types in this little story is unbelievable because it all relates to the New Testament. Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 6 says, Jeremiah said, the words of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hamanel, the son of Shemal, thine uncles shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field that is in Athroth, for the right of redemption is thine. To buy it. So Hamanel, mine uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison according to the word of the Lord and said unto me, By my field, I pray thee, that it is in Athrot, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine, buy it for thyself. Now, what, what is going on here is Leviticus chapter 23, the, the kinsman redeemer and the right, who has the right to redeem the land? Israel could not sell the land because the land was not theirs to sell. It was given to them for, for a, a place to live. So it wasn't theirs to sell. But they did sell it, but they had to do it according to what God said. And they would basically lease it out for 50 years. But during that 50 years, they could buy it back any time they could, or if somebody, if they had a kinsman and redeemer, the kinsman and redeemer would redeem it for them because a kinsman and redeemer has certain rules that they had to go by. But the right of redemption was Jeremiah's. When you look at this story, it has a remarkable way of relating to the New Testament and the Old Testament. Now let's, let's watch this real careful. The word of the Lord, verse 9, And I bought the field of Hamanel, mine uncle's son, that was in Athroth, and weighed him the money, even 17 shekels of silver. Silver is the price of redemption in the Bible. When you go to the tabernacle, the tabernacle was built on blocks of silver. Silver is a type of blood, a type of redemption. And I subscribed the evidence and sealed it and took witness and weighed him the money in the balance. So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and the custom, and that which was open. So you have a sealed document and you have an open document. Now think of it this way. Daniel was told to seal the book. John was told not to seal the book, to leave it open for everyone to see. Isn't that remarkable? I mean, I, I, you can't make this stuff up. But it gets better than that. So I took the evidence, and I gave, uh, verse 12, and I gave the evidence of the purchase to Barak, the son of Neri, the son of Meshai, the son in the sight of Hamanel, mine uncle's son, in the presence of the witnesses that subscribed the book of the purchase. Now look at this. Before all Jews that sat in the court of the prison. When Jesus Christ was crucified, he was crucified when all the Jews were in Jerusalem. He paid our price when all the Jews were in Jerusalem. Here, Jeremiah is making mention that all the Jews that were there saw the transaction taking place and all the legalities being taken care of. I charged 
uh, 13, I charged Barak before them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, the God of Israel, Take these evidence, this evidence of the purchase, both which are sealed and this evidence which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel that they may continue many days. The, the land wasn't taken over immediately. For thus saith the Lord, God, Lord of hosts, verse 15, the God of Israel, the house and the fields and the vineyards shall be be possessed again in this land. It was customary when you bought some land, the previous owner had time to, you ever been evicted? I haven't, but it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. In this, in this day and age, you can't even hardly evict anybody. But back then they gave them two days to get their stuff ready and get it out. And then they would take it over. Well, it's been 2,000 years. In Jeremiah, the, if you take all these names, there's eight of them in this little passage. If you take these names and you line them up like I did here on this board, it shows you something. Jeremiah means God will rise, and God did rise, and he came down to this earth, and he was going to give himself as a redemption for you. He's the kinsman redeemer. He was born of a woman. His father was God. That makes him a kinsman redeemer to everyone here. He's not a kinsman to Adam. He has his father's blood. Jeremiah means Jehovah will rise, and God will rise, and he did rise. Hamanel means God has favor. Mark chapter 1, verse 11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus Christ was examined. He, was, he lived a perfect 33 and a half years before he went to the cross. He was perfect, and God said, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. The next word is shemal, shalom, which means recompense of a reward. Isn't Jesus Christ our recompense? Doesn't he compensate? He, he compensates for our sins. He took, he took our sins upon himself and he bore them on the cross. It means to make a return of equivalent or anything given, done, or suffered as a recompense, a person. That's where your word uh, compensation comes from. The next word is anathroth, which means a base self, a flick, humble yourself. And isn't that what Jesus Christ did when he went to the cross? He humbled himself. The great creator, the creator of all things, took on himself the sins of man and humbled himself. And the Bible says in here, it says, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, and being fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Well, the next word is Benjamin. So what's Benjamin mean? Son of my right hand. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he rose again, and when he ascended up into heaven, he went and he sat on the Right hand of the Father. Barak. And that's one of the first Hebrew words I ever learned is Barak. It's easy. But it means blessed. It's part of a, uh, 
when they bless the food, the, the, the grape, the wine, and the, and the bread at, at the Seder, they have a little saying, it's Barak Adonai, you know, Elohim. I can't remember them anymore because I haven't. But 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus or Lord Je- I have to say Lord Jesus Christ every time I say it, whether it's there or not, from the dead. Romans chapter 4, verse 8, Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. Isn't that something? We're blessed. We don't have to worry about sin. Ner- Neri, boy, what does that mean? That means light of Jehovah. Who's the light of the world? the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have light of life. Wow. All this in just a few, cha- a few verses in the Bible. And then the last one. It's, if I pronounce this wrong, I, I'm sorry. But it looks like Messiah... It means refuge of Jehovah. Who is our refuge? The Lord Jesus Christ. He's our refuge. He's our hope. He's our rest. The pastor was talking about the Sabbath. We don't need the Sabbath. Jesus Christ is our Sabbath. He's our rest. And you don't need it. You don't have to worry about the Sabbath day. You can... Do whatever you want on the Sabbath day because Jesus Christ gave us rest because he is our Sabbath. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. And this is one of the wildest chapters in the Bible, actually, especially in Revelations. And the seven book, the seven seals, sealed book, And who is worthy to open this book? And there's only one that's worthy. Only one. Revelation chapter 5 verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with the seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaim with a voice, loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth. And if you want to know if there's something under the earth, yes, there is. It's inside the earth. It's over and over again all through the Bible. There is something under the earth, and it's coming out. I study this stuff all the time, and I've, it's just amazing what people are seeing. It's scary. Christianity kept it all in. Christianity's disappearing. And when we're gone, heaven help the world. And no man in heaven and earth, neither under the earth, was, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open the book and to read the book, neither to look thereupon. Now this book... I believe is a deed to the world. And I believe that I'm holding that deed in my hand right now. This book, we're going to find out, has seven seals on it. It it used to be only the King James Bible had seven seals. But when the publishers found out, oh, wait a minute, we only got four or we only got three. We need to have seven so we can counterfeit the Bible. But when the King James Bible was first written, the first book, it had seven seals that sealed the pages together. And it, it was like that, and it's still like that. Count your Bible. Numbers are important. But it was placed on the first copies, and we have that deed to the earth. 
and we're going to be looking at why this is the deed of the world. John chapter 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's always been with God. You can't separate God from the Word of God. You can try, but the Bible records who, what, when, where, why, and how. When I was an investigator, that's one of the things we had to answer, all those questions. And when you investigate those questions, you come up with... Uh, a pretty good idea who was doing it. They wouldn't trust me to be an investigator now because <laughs> I always put down the truth. Boy, they don't like that. Who? Genesis chapter 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's ownership. What? Sin got in the way. Where? On this earth, wickedness was going crazy so what when did God take care of it did make the payment for it in the fullness of time when you take that fullness of time and you start looking at it the world is going to last 8,000 years you know when you look at the Bible and it says the day of the Lord people say well it's only when he comes back no the day of the Lord lasts a thousand years that's the Bible. If you don't know, study your Bible. Read it. Why? In Galatians chapter 4, verse 5, he says, To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says, He is the propitiation, the payment, for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the world. He redeemed the world. This world is his. Satan was only given this world for a short time. And the Lord's taken it back. I can't wait. How did he do it? Philippians chapter 2, verse 8 says, And being found and fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus Christ paid it all. Don't worry about your salvation. Worry about how, how, how am I going to face my Creator one day? How am I going to be there in front of Him and give an account whether I did good or bad. First Corinthians chapter one verse two, twenty-two. Who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest spirit of our hearts? When you look at this passage, it says that the word open. When you see that word open, it means understand. In Acts chapter 16, verse 14, Lydia was given, the Lord opened up the scriptures to her, and she attended to the things of Paul. And in Luke chapter 24, verse 32, when Jesus was walking with his disciples after his resurrection, he opened up the scriptures. He gave them understanding. You have the Holy Spirit inside you. The Bible should never be a boring book. If you don't understand something, ask the Holy Spirit. You have to do a lot of praying to, to, to make a Sunday school lesson. You have to do a lot of praying when you're witnessing to people and you're preparing to, to answer their questions. You have, to, you have to do a little study. But the Holy Spirit will give you what you need. You just have to ask Him for it. Revelation chapter 1, 3 says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of the prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. For a time is at hand. It's here. You don't have to be a rocket scientist or a Bible scholar to figure out that we're here. And I, 
I'll tell you what, I'm amazed at this book every time I get into it. And sometimes I can't get into it because I'm, I'm exhausted. I'll, I'll step back and I'll take a day off and I'll say, Lord, you know, just, I'll just talk to you all day and, and I'll get back to it. Because it really, it exhausts you. There's so much in this Bible. Revelation chapter 5 verse 5 says, And one of the elders saith unto to me, Weep not, behold, the Lion of Judah, the Root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the spirit of the seven spirits of God, sent forth unto all the earth. And I and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. The Lord our pastor just preached on a series of when God speaks to God. So don't get surprised at now, how did he do that? God's on the throne. The lamb comes up and takes the book out of his hands. They're, all, they're both the three and one. And a lot of people don't understand that you're a body, soul, and a spirit after you've been saved. Before you're saved, you're just a body and an and a attached soul. And wherever that soul goes, that's where the, or the body goes, that's where the soul goes, straight down. But when you're born again, God comes in and does this operation and cuts away the soul and the spirit. So now you don't have to sin. You don't have to live for the devil. You have freedom because now the Bible tells you to yield to the spirit that spirit that's revived in you, that's living inside you. And that's what makes us Christians so different from everyone else. And that's why we're, we're considered all crazy and terrorist, because they don't understand us. You know, a terrorist that doesn't hurt nobody, that only pre preaches about Jesus Christ, they pay their bills, they live righteously, and they don't cause no trouble, but they're terrorists. Oh, they're evil. Isn't that awful? <laughs> what world? <laughs> and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. I can't wait for that day. You should be praying for that day. Amen. And when he took the book, and he had taken the book, the four beasts and the twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one harps of gold and, and vials of full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And you get into the prayers of the saints here in a little bit, you're going to be surprised how your prayers are answered. Some of them haven't been answered yet, but they're going to be. John is told not to weep for the, for the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is worthy but when he looks at him, he's a lamb. A lot of people get those things confused in the Bible because when you talk about the lion in the Bible, you also talk about the lamb. But the lamb lied down with the wolf, not the lion. But because of that, people get confused because they've never read the Bible until someone mentions something that, oh, the Bible's got a mistake in it. Oh, let's find it. There's no mistakes. Jesus Christ paid the price that no one else could pay. And he'll carry those scars for all eternity. When Jesus, when Jesus Christ comes back and the Jews are all around and they're, they're going to say, who put the scars in your hands? Who did that? He said, I did it in the house. Of, they did it in the house of my brother." And they're going to weep and gnash their teeth and say, oh, Lord. But God planned it all this way. Before the foundations of the earth was created, it was all planned. And the scriptures in the Old Testament 
when you study him, you find out that nothing comes by surprise. Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 25, verse 23 says, the land shall not be sold forever, and it's about ready to be redeemed. There are four types, four things that a kinsman redeemer has to do and has to qualify in order to redeem the land. First, he must be a kinsman. And Jesus Christ came to this earth. He was born of a virgin. We already co covered that. And Ruth, Boaz, was Ruth's kinsman redeemer. But there was someone else that was higher on the chain than Boaz. And he was going to redeem the land, but he said, well, wait a minute, I can't redeem the land if I have to take Ruth. Because if you go back and look at the scriptures, a Moabite could not enter into the kingdom of, uh, into the uh, tabernacle, the sanctuary of the Lord. Couldn't do it. Forever. So something had to change. And God Almighty is already married to the Jews. He's not going to violate his one woman policy. So the only person that was left was Boaz. And Boaz redeemed Ruth and the land. And they lived happily ever after. And, and they were the great grandfather, great 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 grandfather of David. So, you know, you just, it's amazing how this book works together. But Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for our sins and the sins of the world. And he redeemed it all for himself. But we're co-heirs with Christ. I can't get over that one. I'm still amazed. He must be able to redeem. He must be rich. He must be able to, to pay the price. And that price was blood. But not anyone's blood. It had to be pure blood, the blood of God. Animals and goats don't pay for sin. They never have. They covered it up, but the sin was still there. Sin had to be paid for by the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was the vessel that the blood of God came into this world to be broken and spilled out. For us. He must be able, and he is able. And he and I'm a testimony, he he's able. <laughs> Just look at me before I was saved. He must be willing to redeem. Not everybody can, uh, is willing to redeem. They might have the money. They might, have the, they might be a kinsman or redeemer, but they don't want to. Just like God says, I, I, it'll mar my inheritance. He must pay in full. And when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he paid in full. Amen. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which is contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. When you look at, look at all the, the law, and you go down and you study the law, and you look at how, how it's laid out, and then you go to the life of Jesus Christ, He says, I, I don't come, he, I, I didn't come to, to destroy the law. Matthew chapter 5 verse 17 says, I think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, but I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. And that's what he did. He fulfilled everything. And before it's all over with, every dot and every tittle, it says here in verse 8, he says, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle shall 
in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So Jesus Christ fulfills the law. You ain't going to do it. I'm not going to do it. The Jews back in the Old Testament didn't do it. As much as they tried, they couldn't do it. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So Jesus Christ paid that price. Now we already covered about the four and twenty elders. They were redeemed from every tribe, every tribe, every nation, you know. It's just like us. They're probably men of great standing with the Lord. But when you get into this, you look at look at what he says here in verse 6. He says, I beheld in the midst of the throne and four beasts of the, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb that was slain seven horns and seven eyes and seven spirits. Those seven spirits took the word of God throughout the world. And I always hear this, well, the gospel hasn't been everywhere yet. Yes, it has several times. You don't need an American taking the gospel to every part of the world. You don't. God is not, a, God is not an American. Thank God. We'd be in trouble. We got more missionaries coming from overseas into this country to, to evangelize us than we have going out. The reverse has happened because we turned away from God and God is taking his hand off of America. And if you don't see that, you got a problem. Well, oh, I can't wait till the Lord comes back. I just can't wait. I can't wait till he sets everything right. And I know there's a lot of people out here that have loved ones that they want to be seen get right with the Lord before he comes back. But God will take care of all that. There's going to be more people saved during the tribulation than, than, than right now. Wait till 144,000 gets turned loose. But in the tribulation, you're not going to get saved by grace through faith. You're going to get saved by faith and works, and you're going to have to die. Right now, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came to this earth, he gave himself to the cross. He shed his blood for us. And here in this house, we've received that blood. We've had the blood applied. You know, I was... I was talking, to, I, I taught a lesson on the eagle one time, and, and uh, I've always had a fascination for those eagles. And Ronnie says, well, you know, they apply the blood to an adopted chicklet. So I, I checked into it. Not only do they give it to an eaglet that's been deserted, but they'll also adopt a hawk that's been abandoned. And they'll take their beak and they'll do a little dash there on the chest and They'll take the blood and apply it to them. Have you had the blood applied? Amen. Are you an adopted son? The eagle's a fascinating character. I like it because it's got 66 chromosomes. And it's compared to the word of God. 66 books. Can't make this stuff up. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love we are we're predestinated but we're predestinated to be conformed to the image of Christ. You choose God, God chooses you. It's not the other way around. 
where you get chosen and then, then God uh, predestinates you. You choose the Lord Jesus Christ and he chooses you. He will never turn anyone down. Not a one. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. And the four beasts and the twenty elders fell down before them having before the Lamb, having every one the harps and the golden vials, which are the prayers of the saints. When you look at these prayers of the saints, you got to think of it this way. Every prayer that you pray that's right gets put in a vial and is stored away until the tribulation. And then God takes that, that, those prayers of the saints and he puts them in a vials and he gives them to the angels and they mix it with fire and they, they do all this stuff and then they pour out the wrath of God on this earth. Now, when you look at that, you have to, when you're taking the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven vials, this indicates that during the first three and a half years of the tribulation, the first seven vials will be poured out, or the seven seals will be loosened. And when you get to the last one, he says it's by the silence in, in heaven for a space of a half hour. Then he calls the trumpets. So you go say, well, that's right. The other guy was wrong. The Bible's right. Everyone else is wrong. But you put that there because I've always listened to other people and I go, oh, that must be right because they studied it. And then you go back and study it and that, no, that's not right. <laughs> Revelation is a confusing book. But when you get to Revelation chapter 8, it will explain it. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. We've got five minutes. And they sang a new song, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, and hast redeemed us by the blood of out of every kindred and tongue and people. So you know where all, every, everyone that's up there before the throne is from. It's from this church and other churches like us, born again believers. Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. Thus, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. Isn't that something? We'll get rid of all those deep states and all that other stuff. That'll all be gone. We'll be ruling with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I beheld and, and I heard the voice of many angels. You look at that angels and you go, oh, what's the angels doing there? I thought we were the only ones there. Round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000s thousand and thousands and thousands. Let's look what the Bible says about angels. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2 says, And to you who are troubled, troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Mighty angels, I thought it was us. Revelation chapter 7, verse 11 says, And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. I thought that was going to be us. It is you. You want to know what you're going to be like? You're going to be like one of the angels. But you're going to be a different type of angel. You're going to be God's mighty angels. Matthew chapter 22, verse 30 says, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor given in marriage. This is Jesus Christ speaking. But are as the angels of God in heaven. Boy, is that going to be something. Wow. And he's going, we're going to be kings and priests. And we're going to be 
co-inheritors with Christ. We're going to be conformed to his image. Wow. When Jesus Christ was here on earth, they, they said, crucify him. He was poor. He didn't have a place to lay his head. He's a fool. He became weak. He was dishonored. He was shamed. He became a curse for us. But in heaven, he's worthy of power. He's worthy of riches. He's worthy of wisdom. He's worthy of strength. He's worthy of honor. He's worthy of glory. He's worthy of blessings. Revelation chapter 15, verse 13. Every creature which is in heaven and on earth. Now get this. This is wild. And if you line these in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and such are in the sea, the Lord God warned us about this all the way back in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Thou shalt make unto thee any graven images or any likeness that isn't in the heaven above or is in the earth beneath or is in the water under the earth. So there's things under there that God was warning us about. But he says in verse 13, he says, Under the sea, all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power unto him that sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. All these creatures on earth, your little pets, your little farm animals, all these creatures all over the earth, every man, every demon, every devil, everything that you can possibly think of in the earth, over the earth, under the sea, under the earth, are all going to cry simultaneously, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sit upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. It's all going to come out of their mouths. And then God's going to pour his wrath down upon them. But before they, he pours his wrath out, he's going to make them say what he wants everyone to say. So if you're thinking, well, I'll just, I won't give no glory or honor. You know, this, this house should ring every time you hear something that you agree with in the pulpit. You should hear the amens and praise the Lord's. When I was up north, everybody thought I was nuts because, praise the Lord, hallelujah, amen. And everybody else going, But I love the King James Bible too. They didn't. Revelation chapter 5 verse 14. And the four beasts said amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And that's what we should be doing now. <laughs> Don't you love it? Don't you love this book? I mean it's wild. Like I told some people, I, I wrote a book, uh, a uh, thing on Revelations 10 years ago, and I went back and started revising it, and I was like, oh my goodness, what was I thinking? Everything's changed. Everything. The wickedness in this world is just unbelievable. Let's pray. Our dear, precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that you'll be with us today in this service, Lord, and I pray that you'll open up the book, and I pray for 
our speaker, that you'll bless him with the power on high, the Holy Spirit, to reveal those things which we need to hear. We thank you, Lord, for being so good to, to our church and our pastor and our, our children. Thank you for letting them hear the truth. And, Lord, we pray, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come soon. For we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.